really excited today to uh, host a panel on possible reimbursement mechanisms for digital mental health treatments. I'm joined at the moment by uh, Dr. Oliver Harrison, uh, Dr. Yuri Marishi, and uh, Dr. Michael Schoenbaum, and uh, we're waiting on some other panelists. So uh, I'm going to introduce the panelists that are here. I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Oliver Harrison. He is the founder and CEO of COA Health, a company tackling the chronic shortage of clinicians through comprehensive digital first mental health care. The company's solutions are developed by uh, clinician academicians and test in clinical trials. He is a psychiatrist with training in neuroscience from Cambridge, as well as a master's in public health from Johns Hopkins. Convinced that only digital solutions could expand access to mental health care, he spent five years in the McKinsey Health Technology Practice. In 2006, he was recruited to help build a modern healthcare system in the United Arab Emirates, and he spent seven years there as Director of Public Health, putting data at the heart of the new healthcare system used to tackle a number of issues such as chronic disease, road traffic accidents, and infectious disease. And based on all these successes, he advises the World Health Organization, the Wellcome Trust, the World Bank, and NHS England, and uh, has had a number of other very prestigious roles. So thank you for joining us. Thanks, Adam. Uh, we are also joined uh, by, by Dr. Stephen Chan. Dr. Chan's ideas, thoughts, and research have been featured in JAMA, Telemedicine, and eHealth, as well as in JAMIR. He has designed and developed an interactive voice user interface for Microsoft and has served in some government roles as well. He has previously served as a U.S. Department of Health and Human Services backed APA SAMHSA MFP fellow, and he serves on the APA Committee on Mental Health Information Technology, the APA Committee on Telepsychiatry, and the Work Group on Mental Health and Psychiatric Apps. Dr. Chan holds a medical doctorate and an MBA from UC Irvine and has additionally served and studied at numerous California institutions, including Berkeley and Stanford. He is additionally a clinician and has treated a variety of patients, including veterans, felons, and the homeless. We are additionally joined, and, and thank you and welcome. Thanks for coming. We're additionally joined by uh, Brenda Jackson, who specializes in policy, program design, and implementation, and regulatory analysis for Medicaid and the children's health insurance programs with focus on delivery system innovation, value-based purchasing, and federally qualified health centers, as well as issues related to intellectual and developmental disability and behavioral health system issues. She is the principal at Brenda Jackson Consulting and has worked with over 20 states in her consulting work to design Medicaid, CHIP, and Medicare programs, as well as other programs for the uninsured. She works with many different states uh, and has done so with Mercer and TriWest Group, and has done uh, various things related to behavioral health redesign. She holds a master's in public policy from the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. And she's been in this field since 1993. She has a son that has a co-occurring developmental disability and mental illness, who receives Medicaid waiver services. So this is not just something professional, this is also uh, personal. Uh, thank you for joining us. Next, we're joined uh, by Dr. Uh, Yuri Maurich. He is a physician and inventor, as well as clinical developer and strategist. He works to improve patient health and the health system by investing in, advising, and providing leadership at innovative firms. He is uh, most recently known for his work at Pair Therapeutics, where he leads the clinical, regulatory, and quality groups as the chief medical officer and head of development in addition to overseeing uh, subsequent programs across a broad spectrum of disease areas, he has led the Reset, Reset O, and SOMRIS programs. Prior to joining PEAR, Dr. Marich worked with and led successful teams and programs at several healthcare and life sciences firms. And uh, while well, he was a med student, he did some work related to artificial intelligence and natural language processing. He earned his doctorate in medicine at the University of Washington and his MBA at Harvard Business School. And uh, finally, I'd like to introduce, uh, and welcome, thank you for joining us. And uh, finally, I'd like to introduce Dr. Michael Schoenbaum. He is a senior advisor for mental health services, epidemiology and economics at the National Institute of Mental Health's Division of uh, Services and in Intervention Research. 
He conducts analyses of mental health burden, service use and costs, as well as intervention opportunities uh, and policy related issues in order to support the Institute's decision making. His research has uh, focused particularly on the benefits and costs of interventions to improve health and healthcare, and he's evaluated the perspectives of patients, providers, payers, and society. He holds a PhD in economics from Yale. So uh, this is a really exciting group of people. And what I think is, is most impressive about this group is its uh, diversity in interests and in areas of pursuits. We've got people in policy, we've got developers, we've got a clinician, uh, we've cl multiple clinicians, we've got someone from the government. This is truly a multidisciplinary group. And the reason why I wanna highlight this is because this is exactly what the Society for Digital Mental Health is about. It's about getting people uh, from different perspectives that are different stakeholders in this ecosystem talking together about important issues that impact us all. Um, so we are really privileged today to have these wonderful speakers here. And what we're gonna do is we are gonna ask them a series of questions about issues related to reimbursement. We'll hear their perspectives. And then after doing so, we will uh, take us some Q&A from the audience and hear the audience's perspective as well. So to ground this conversation in policy, I'd like to uh, ask a question of Brenda Jackson. And after she responds, we can have some additional people respond, uh, providing their inputs from their own positions in this field. So there seem to be at least two different routes for reimbursement for digital mental health treatments. Uh, digital therapeutics requiring FDA certification and over the counter not requiring FDA certification. What do you see uh, as the strengths and weaknesses of each of these routes? Um, thank you, Adam. It really depends upon whether you're talking about reimbursement for the device and the maker and the industry, or whether you're talking about reimbursement for the therapist who is going to be using the, um, the, the, the therapy itself, the digital intervention. Um, one of the things that I've worked with, um, with different clients is if you're talking about the device and getting FDA approval for the device, then you need to get what in, in the government terms is called durable medical equipment approval through the FDA. But the issue is, is that there's a fine line between durable medical equipment and assistive technology. And while durable medical equipment might be paid for by Medicare and Medicaid, and then commercial insurers will pick it up, assistive technology doesn't work quite that way. It's seen more as a, an optional therapeutics. And so it makes it very, very difficult to, um, to get that uh, assistive technology paid for. Um, as a technology. The other thing that I always look at is, again, are you trying to get the device and the, 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 the research and startup costs paid for for the, the device? Or are you trying to get the practitioner reimbursed for their intervention and um, trying to get to make sure it's, it's cost effective and the, the costs for the therapist are get, being paid for? And you really have to think through each one of those, which what are you talking about exactly in terms of getting reimbursed? Because for example, in Medicaid, at, which has a lot of commercial insurers, you would need a licensed practitioner to be using the therapy to be able to get their time reimbursed and they would have to have a prescription and a recommendation. And so it really, it, it, it's, it's complicated because we're talking about an intersection of several different, different items and, and fields. Is that what you were looking for, Adam? Uh, most definitely. Does someone else want to chime in? Um, I'm happy to. I, I should say, by way of general disclosure, my comments, I, I work at the National Institute of Mental Health, but my comments are my own and don't necessarily reflect the views of my employer. I have an obligation to say that. Um, so I, I guess I'm I guess I'm going to, at the risk of being, um, I don't know, pokey, iconoclastic, um, I, I actually find the framing to be unintuitive and incomplete. Um, 
So, uh, you know, it, it, there's path A, or, you know, and, and path B. I, I actually think there are a bunch of, a, of other paths and the, the, the details matter a lot in ways that, um, that Brenda was just alluding to. But let, let's start with the two, you know, A and B that you, that you Adam, uh, laid out. So, so over the counter, I think it's just a way of saying the patient pays, um, I mean, for tools that are intended for patient use. And, and that's even a conversation, right? Because there are digital therapeutics that are intended for clinician use or for clinician use with the patient, not just the patient, but, but anyhow. So, so let's start o over the counter is a way of saying the patient pays, but maybe that the patient could use pre-tax money from a flexible spending account for healthcare, right? That requires some kind of designation in you know, tax law um, and you know, pr provides um, a, a, a little bit of price advantage. Um, but, you know, basically, I, I, I think for <clears throat> the only regulatory action in that case is the determination that, that, the, that the, the product qualifies under FSA reimbursement. Um, FDA certification, I, 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 I mean, I guess I know how the field came to this. Um, in practice, I think it's followed a path, as, as in fact, Brenda was alluding to describing, um, that is much more similar to FDA action on medical devices. Um, then to the path that FDA requires for a new clinical indication for a drug. Um, and, you know, I, I think the experience from the field, uh, you know, Pear was a leader in this, and so we should hear from our Pear colleagues, but I think the experience has been um, that FDA certification following that path has so far neither been sufficient nor necessary for insurance payment for particular digital therapeutics. And so, uh, you know, it, it, it just, whatever else, it has not offered a clear path um, to health insurance payment. And I think there are multiple reasons for that. Um, one is um, that the standard of evidence for certification has evidently, explicitly, not convinced payers that a given product is actually efficacious or effective. I mean, the, the clearest statement about that was a, a, a public, um, a, a public position articulated by Aetna um, somewhat recently on, on, you know, identifying a long list of digital therapeutics that, that they regarded as not having, for their purposes, been proven to be effective enough that, that they thought payment was um, warranted. Um, and, and those were not limited to digital therapeutics in the behavioral health space. Um, but also, I mean, stepping back a little bit, conceptually and logistically, digital therapeutics aren't, often aren't ready analogs to medical devices. <laughs> that is, it, it, is it a thing you buy in discrete units, such as that if you give it to or use it for or with one patient or in a single patient visit, then you need another one for the next patient or the next patient visit? Um, that's inherently true for many devices, but um, if the analog here is a software license, um, it, it's analogous to a stent um, only because that's how the developer has chosen to implement the license. Um, it, it's not inherent to the technology um, that, that it is equivalent in that sense to a physical object that gets you know, used on a patient or, 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 or put in a patient. Um, and, and that gets me to the, the general point, which other people can comment on too, that, that these two are far from the only options. I mean, just thinking off the top of my head, insurers could license a given tool for their entire beneficiary population, um, you know, a kind of a meta site license who could then self-refer or be referred by clinicians to that tool. The, the same act in principle is true for digital therapeutics that are designed for clinician as opposed to patient use. The problem there is that it's very difficult for clinicians to implement payer-specific workflows. So if one payer has a site license for some tool and other payers don't have a site license for that tool, it's a big headache for the clinician. Um, but for tools that clinicians use, um, clinicians could license a given tool for their entire practice, um, the way they do with other kind of capital infrastructure, and whether it makes economic sense for them to do that so that the insurer doesn't have any direct role in this, whether it makes economic sense for them to do that depends on the value proposition for the digital therapeutic, which I know is something we will discuss later 
um, in this session. And so I'll hold my comments about that and shut up for now. Uh, thank you. So it's, it's great to hear all this input. Uh, just in the interest of time, I want to move on to an adjacent topic. We have two people that are associated with developers in the room. Uh, so what steps do you think developers and other stakeholders should take to support the reimbursement of digital mental health treatments? And I want to uh, start with Dr. Harrison, and uh, then after that, go to Dr. Marowicz. Well, fabulous. Uh, thanks, Adam. And I really like both Brenda and Michael's comments on the previous question. So um, to answer this question, um, I think this is emerging new technology. So I think everyone's getting used to it. And in addition, it's multi-stakeholder. So I very much welcome the society coming together to bring those groups together to do some joint brainstorming. But to answer the question, I think from, um, from a developer's perspective, um, it's really important that development is linked with the AAA in healthcare to so quality access and cost effectiveness. That should be the goal of the use of digital technology for mental health. Um, and I think uh, in addition, uh, we need to be pragmatic about um, the use of existing regulatory pathways and existing reimbursement pathways, because we know it takes time for a new regulatory pathway or a new reimbursement pathway to be created. Really interesting, actually, to Michael's point about there being more than two routes to reimbursement to see big health, for example, using PBM reimbursement uh, for sleepio and daylight. Um, I think developers also need to make the case for change to regulators and to payers and explain that as ever in healthcare, the idea that you can create value, as in you can improve a performance against the triple aim, doesn't automatically mean that you can capture that value as dollars in the bank. Um, and it's really important that we work together with statutory bodies, federal bodies, state bodies, and so on to get the right pathways set up, but that takes time. So I think developers also need to have a lot of patience. This is not gonna happen overnight. In terms of researchers, I think we spend a lot of time um, uh, barking, at, uh, barking at the moon and uh, a lot of publications are not really focused on the residual questions that need to be answered for technology. So for example, we know that smartphones are near ubiquitous. Um, we know that uh, certainly there are edge cases with access challenges, but by and large, they are one of the most accessible channels that we've seen in human history. We know that data can be managed securely, um, but we need to think outside of the box. For example, you can't take the idea of um, Bradford Hill criteria or the idea of linear dose response from pharma pharmacology and drop it into a digital tech paradigm. It's, it's a different paradigm. Um, so it's important to rethink what we need to rethink. Then there is a desperate need, I would say, in the literature for um, research on methods uh, and for there to be a consensus between researchers, editors and regulators around what is a sufficient study. And I think particularly around uh, control group design so um, the fashion seems to be changing away from weightless control to looking at alternative controls. Uh, we need to think about endpoints that are relevant uh, for digital technology. And then finally, um, we need to think about efficiency in research. So how can we do better trials and make sure that they are more impactful in terms of the research output? From a health system perspective, I think it's important that the stakeholders recognize that the state of the art is broken. I would challenge anyone in the conference to say, mental health, behavioral health in the US is a shining light of how it should be done. Um, and I think within that, uh, we have a particular shortage of clinicians. Um, so in order to if effectively increase access by opening bandwidth in the limited clinician pool, we need to have extended technologies and those extended technologies in the 21st century are almost certainly digital tech. So this needs to come and they should embrace that in the spirit of trying to add more value to their covered lives. Um, and I think final point is for, for the health systems, they should start thinking about a value-based um, uh, philosophy and use that to really guide um, uh, their design. How can we open up access? How can we ensure consistent high quality? And how can we ensure a better bang for buck uh, on cost effectiveness? So those are just a few comments. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Markic. Um, <clears throat> sure, ha happy to maybe provide a few thoughts from a developer perspective and love to maybe just share a couple of thoughts. I think Mike Michael gave us a lot to think about um, with some of his thoughts as well. I mean, I think when I first, you know, kind of step back, we are obviously in the midst of a whole new sector that is very much emerging. And uh, many of the pathways 
be they clinical, be they regulatory, be they reimbursement, we're not designed for these types of treatments, right? So I think it sounds like that's something we all agree on. Um, you know, I, I personally think of regulatory review as being very distinct from reimbursement. There is some read through, but FDA is actually prohibited, right, from stepping into the reimbursement decision making process. Um, and so, you know, part of I think the value, at least from going through FDA, is not for reimbursement, but rather because what we're doing in creating a whole new treatment class um, requires us to make sure that we have set standards for trust, trust with patients, trust with clinicians, trust with other stakeholder institutions. And so having an independent body whose job it is to protect the public health, to review that data and provide a label is important. Um, on the back side, once you do get that, and, and we're seeing you know, many new types of technologies, whether software alone, software plus drugs, where it's treating serious disease, um, there's obviously over-the-counter, um, as was mentioned as well, and, and those are legitimate pathways. I think then comes the business model part, and I think this is where developers do have to be very thoughtful of what are the patient populations that we're focused on, and then what are the appropriate business models, right? So there might be some where it is more of a direct-to-consumer patient pay out of pocket. Um, you know, our approach for many of the patients that, that we address at PAIR um, are patients with substance use disorder, opioid use disorder, very serious disease, oftentimes co-occurring mental health. These are Medicaid, these are dual eligible. These are patients who do not have the means to pay out of pocket. They oftentimes are not employed. Um, and so taking a reimbursement pathway that helps us to address those who really are the most in need our society, particularly in mental health and behavioral health is important. And so that's why we've taken the approach to work very closely with Medicaid, for example. And we've done a number of um, Medicaid coverage, both traditional coverage, as well as um, we've shared publicly also value-based um, agreements as well, which I think is an awesome opportunity for, for digital is to be aligned on that, on that risk taking. Um, and then I, I think maybe just the, the last thought maybe as um, really excited to hear, hear Stephen's comments, but as we think through um, some of the, the kind of downstream impacts, we need to create standard reimbursement pathways with payers that, that facilitate coverage for all those different patient populations so that our, our treatments that are digital treatments are not only for those who have sufficient economic means, but we're really reaching the people most in, in need. And so that's where I think we also need payers to come together and say, are we pharmacy? Are we medical benefit? How do we account for CBT? Right now, it's like everything and it's a mess and you have to do all, all the above as a developer. Um, rather than be able to target based on on which patient populations you're going to be serving. Thank you. Is there anyone else any thoughts? I'd just like to add, Yuri, we wish you Godspeed from Coa Health, and uh, we're watching with great interest what happens. I think one of the benefits of both the regulatory and reimbursement systems is they are predicate based, and uh, it's not easy being the pioneer. It takes time and money. Um, but uh, but I think there are a number of right-minded companies that are watchful waiting. Yeah, but so so whether it but the this predicate basis thing is a mess. I mean, basically, I agree, Yuri, that there there needs to there need to be standard pathways. So you know, j just to I guess to preempt a, a straw man, standard pathway does not mean one CPT code for digital therapeutics NOS. Like, I just think that's that's insane um, for, for anybody even to consider it because it just doesn't match the heterogeneity of the space of the technologies um, and the purposes and the and the cost drivers and so on. So, I mean, I mentioned before about value proposition and, you know, Oliver said some of the things I would have said too, right? I mean, the dog that I have in this fight is the public interest. I'm, I'm really only interested in just discussing viable payment for things that are 
plausibly safe, effective, and you know, efficient. If they are, I totally want to go to bat for that. The health system should figure out how to pay for them. If they aren't, I'm not interested, or even I'm opposed, depending. <laughs> um, uh, but but like value proposition, right? So like it, it for tools that are proprietary um, and unique in the sense of not having clear clinical substitutes, then value makes sense from an economist perspective in the same sense as other innovative, you know, technological innovations. Um, and then the, you know, the, the owners basically of that technology should try to make the argument that this um, fills some need for which there isn't a good substitute. Um, and it is in that sense, a unique thing, right? It's a new service to be added to the toolbox of healthcare. And as long as the, uh, you know, it's discrete IP and the, uh, you know, and, and their IP protections, then the owners of that IP can pursue um, reimbursement however they, they want to price the product. Um, for other things, I think actually the way broadly that we figure out healthcare reimbursement is in, in, in relation to cost. <laughs> Uh, I mean, not price setting, but at least the way people figure out valuation for other kinds of services in healthcare um, for which there are ready substitutes or that are in the public domain or that are services that aren't protected by discrete IP is, is in figuring out what are the costs associated with delivering those things that viable means you're at least covering the cost plus, um, you know, rents. Um, so does the technology involve consumables? Does it involve variable cost. What's the basis of variation? The patient, the single use, the clinic, the total number of patients or clinicians or sites, the time window over which it's used. Does it require time and effort from any human professional versus time and effort from the patient or from patients informal caregivers, which we kind of in the health system regard as free? Um, uh, if so, what time and effort from what kind of human professionals? Um, what does, does it require input from other technologies? Does the technology replace time and effort from any human professionals, right? I mean, for, for, for digital therapeutics that are a substitute, for example, for human psychotherapy, um, the, the right model conceptually shouldn't be, we price this the way we price stents, or we review this the way we review stents. The, 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 like the conceptually efficient way to think about it if you're a payer is like, well, I should price this so that it makes sense to, to, to like, I should price it in the way that I'm thinking about the substitutes I'm pricing, <laughs> you know, how, how I'm pricing those substitutes. Anyway, I, I'm, I'm ranting again, so I'll, I'll stop. Now, well, and that works in a value-based purchasing model where you're, you're pricing it with what you're being cost-effective compared to. But let's be honest, with COVID, we've started to already see Medicare and Medicaid go out on a limb and start pricing um, different types of uh, digital mental health. For example, online therapy and portal access and portal driven therapies. And so there's already AMA guidance out there. There's already Medicare and Medicaid guidance out there on how to do that type of digital interventions. And it does look at what's the cost of maybe the underlying electronic um, platform, but it really looks at how much cost and time is the practitioner putting into those systems. What we don't have a really good way of pricing and reimbursing are therapist-assisted technologies such as text or um, artificial intelligence or other internet-based, device-based um, things where you're not having the same level of therapist intervention. That's one of the where, places that I'm struggling with how to figure out how to reimburse those things in a public system because, and virtual reality would be another one where there, there is quite a bit of upfront um, industry involvement in the development of the, the technology and the amount of practitioner costs to intervene with the client are less. And so you really have to, that's why I come, keep coming back to what are you trying to reimburse? Are you trying to get the therapist to be reimbursed for their time so that they use the technology and that they've purchased it for their practice? Or are you trying to make sure that the, the industry has priced the technology appropriately for the practitioner to develop it or to, 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 purchase it for their practice, really thinking about what it is, because I think you said it, there is no homogeneous 
reimbursement methodology. I think we have to think in terms of what are some standardized categories that can be created for the industry. And we have to go to the AMA and to CMS for the HICPICs. And we have to say, look, there's, there's online therapy, there's portal interactions, there's artificial intelligence interactions, there's virtual reality, and, and come up with some standardized ways of interacting. Because what we're also seeing is that the AMA is not necessarily as interested in developing CPT codes for all of these. We may have to end up getting a lot of CMS involvement to get the HICPIC codes developed because it's not going to be something that the AMA is going to develop codes with, and, and which is not necessarily the greatest answer, but there is quite a bit of backdoor interactions that maybe the industry is going to have to come up with so that there's an industry um, strategy that's developed. Sorry. If I may, just for 10 seconds. Um, so one of the answers, Brenda, to that in, in, in innovative health systems beyond the US and actually in ACOs and MCOs in the US is to pay for the outcome, which could be the patient in remission, and then have somebody on the hook for aggregating the use of tech and innovating on the use of tech to get that outcome for the lowest dollar amount. Absolutely. I completely agree. In fact, I think that value-based purchasing, um, outcome-based payments will be the easiest to convince Medicaid plans to take on. Um, I think that it will be a harder challenge to get Medicare to pull that, to, to take that on, especially in mental health, because it's not a traditional area that, that Medicare has, has shown a lot of growth in and has shown a lot of innovation in. But I completely agree that when we talk about public systems, Medicaid value-based purchasing is probably one of the biggest ways that you can see your innovations because it won't take a unified federal government initiative to, to get the reimbursement. I completely agree with you, Oliver. And I think that commercial plans are open to that as well. Oh, thank you. So I'm going to throw out one more question. Uh, perhaps uh, Dr. Chang could chime in. What do you wish researchers better understood about the pathways from basic research through the translational pipeline to commercialization and eventual reimbursable service delivery? Because there's a lot of researchers in this audience. What do we all need to know? And then after that, we'll go to Q&A. Yeah, um, one of the, one of the uh, most challenging things is just seeing the entire pipeline from start to finish, as you alluded to, and understanding the process from the get go is important. It's not just writing for grants. It's not just writing for one off pilots or feasibility studies. Uh, really working with innovation officers, technology transfer off, um, offices at your institution is going to be very important. And learning from other academics who have gone through a commercialization route or as some sort of reimbursement route will be important because the last thing you really want to do is work on a project that's just gonna die halfway through. And even if it is commercialized, you know, what part of it is viable and feasible for current fi uh, continued financial sustainability. So one of the you know, things that I've looked at uh, with my past research teams, uh, one of them is at UCSF, um, they're actually working on a clearinghouse for digital health software tools. It's called Advice Health. And essentially, they're trying to uh, put together a centralized certification and accreditation style process, a marketplace. Um, but just understanding the whole research process, putting together the stakeholders and ensuring that there's um, a way to make this a reality is going to be important. Uh, but I, this is why I appreciate the conversations about the reimbursement landscape. It's not just going to be one-off feasibility studies like we've seen over the past decade. Thank you. Does anyone else have any thoughts? Well, I think some research is <coughs> research for the love of the science, right? But quite a few researchers, particularly in this space, want to see real-world impact. So I think if you want to deliver real-world impact, it behoves you, I think, to understand what happens when your research then goes into a developer and uh, is brought to market, at least in outline, um, because the methods are the opposite of a traditional pharma or med device linear waterfall process. And it's an agile process where you build, measure, learn, much more analogous to an engineering type model, like an Edison type model than to a traditional pharmaceutical company. Um, but I think researchers that want to understand that 
uh, should really um, uh, get, get a little bit knowledgeable about that so their research can then be coterminous and fit in with uh, the longer term developer pathway. Yeah. And I'll, I'll just add on, I think, Oliver, I, I agree in very much what um, Stephen was saying here is that um, RCTs are, are necessary, but they're not sufficient, particularly at this early um, in the life cycle aspect. And um, so very much thinking about the development where you're going to have to do RCTs and the appropriate population against the appropriate control, and in many cases, that standard of care then you need to add on the real world ev evidence, right? Is this generalizable? Will people really use this in the real world? And then health economic and health economic really has to look at total cost of care with claims. That's what payers are really gonna be looking at to make their decision making. And then this is related to payers, but it's also related to clinical use is I think an enormous need, but also opportunity is on implementation science. So implementation science can help do two things. One is on the clinical delivery side, it helps us to better understand how do we integrate this into clinical care, who's the right patient population and the right individual patient that I might use this with in an individual visit, and then how do I deliver that and think about that long term. And payers are also very interested in this because they want to not just know if I am going to cover this, who is it for, what's the patients I should expect response in, um, and then what kind of data do I evaluate, am I making an impact or not. Oh, thank you. And so I just want to take one quick question from the audience. I noticed there was one uh, person in the audience, uh, Ricardo, who had asked whether there's uh, a space for things to be free. Uh, how does it change things if things are, are not being reimbursed, if it's like a, a MOOC, a massive open online course where there's no charge? And then uh, we'll unfortunately have to close out the session. Well, maybe just to get started of course nothing's free somebody's somebody's kind of paying and particularly if you want um uh, uh, uh an impactful efficacious and engaging healthcare product it takes real dollars to build that and those dollars need to come from somewhere i don't think a, 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 a mooc or wikipedia or, or, or anything like that could be used for for healthcare maybe i'm missing that so i think the question then is well who pays and how do they pay um and uh, I think particularly if we're thinking about people from lower socioeconomic status um, uh, and thinking beyond CMS, um, there are a range of options. Um, and uh, we're just about to launch a major initiative with a uh, telecommunications company in the UK where they are offering free in the market because they're wholesale buying licenses for use of some of our technology. And that's one model where you can at least get people started on their mental health care journey um by somebody essentially kind of paying for it to be free thank you yeah. so uh okay. unfortunately our session is coming to a close i'd like to thank the panelists and also thank Rhonda robinson beale who unfortunately had a flight delay and wasn't able to make it uh, to this session this has been really uh, an invigorating session and i feel like we could have easily had another hour but unfortunately uh, our time has elapsed so what's going to happen next is we have a 10 minute break and then after the break concludes, we are going to move on to the flash talks. And so what you'll be able to see in the lobby of the Zoom interface is the different flash talk session tracks. If you're speaking at a flash talk, please pick the one that you're going to be participating in. And if you're not, you can pick whatever is of most interest to you. You can read uh, what the flash talk tracks are about within the Zoom interface and uh, have fun. I want to once again thank the panelists. This has been truly a wonderful session, and I just wish we had more time because there is so much to discuss in the important topic of reimbursement. Thank you. And uh, feel free to email us for follow-up questions. We're happy to pass them on. Take care, everyone.